The name of this Bible study is going to be The Arabs in Bible Prophecy. Turn your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32 and verse 25. The sword without, and that means war, the sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young men and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs, I said. I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Were it not that I fear the wrath of the enemy, lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely and lest they should say, our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done this. In other words, the uh, heathen are going to think that they're the ones that did this. So, the Lord didn't do a complete destruction. Deuteronomy 32, 28. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. In the book of Psalms, chapter 9 and verse 17, we read, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. Now, I ask you a question. Is the USA a nation that has forgotten God? Hmm, good question. Terror. You know, it says, The sword without and terror within shall destroy both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also with the man of gray hairs. Now, terror, now, that is a word we've heard much of in the news lately. And I, for one, know that the TV programming, and news is violently antichrist, as well as almost all of its programs. I mean, virtually everything. The only truth that we're going to find in this world, we will find in God's Word, the Holy Bible, and its prophecy. And I feel that you should use the King James Bible. I That is the one that I trust the most. But we need to take a look at the Arab world from the eyes of God's Word. Let us go back to Genesis, the beginning, and see what it has to say about Abraham. Now, a lot of people say that they are the children of Abraham. Not only do the Jews say that they're of Abraham, but the Many of the Hindus of India say they're from Abraham. And the, the Muslims, the Arabs, Islam says they are also from Abraham. So Abraham was married to Sarah, his wife, and she was old and she was barren of children. So she got tired of waiting on God so Sarah told Abraham to have a child by her handmaiden, whose name was Hagar. Now, Hagar was an Egyptian woman, and she had a son by Abraham, who was named Ishmael. So let's take a look in Genesis 16 and verse 11. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, he's speaking to Hagar, Behold, thou art with child, and shalt bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. Ishmael's name means the Lord has heard. And he was Abraham's firstborn male son. And like any father, Abraham loved him greatly. 
Now, Abraham asked the Lord to make Ishmael the promised seed. And this is what the Lord said to Abraham. Let's turn to Genesis 17 and verse 20. And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him. Did you hear that? Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. Now, you don't have twelve princes unless each prince has like some kind of a kingdom, you know? And I will make him a great nation. So look at this carefully. The Lord said he would bless Ishmael, make him fruitful, multiply him, and with 12 princes make of him a great nation. However, was he to be the promised seed? You see, the Arabic nations are blessed with oil and some very good crop growing areas. Do you know that the Nile Delta in Egypt, for example, that was the breadbasket of the Middle East and also the Roman Empire. So that's why everybody was always wanting to conquer Egypt because of the Nile River Valley. The Nile River used to, because of the water in, that, in the Nile, in that region, it grew a lot of crops. So it was a very, very desirable area to have. Okay, let's continue on. In Genesis chapter 17 and verse 19, God speaking to Abraham. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. Isn't that interesting? God named Isaac. God named him. And thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed, or children, and with his seed after him. So Isaac was to be the promised seed, not Ishmael, even though Ishmael was the firstborn son, and God said he was going to bless him and make him fruitful and multiply him. Now, the time was come that there was friction in the family of Abraham, you know, with his having two sons by two different wives. You know, the in the days of King David, David had multiple wives and multiple sons by these wives, and each son wanted to be the king. And King David had a son named Absalom. Now, you know, that's the thing. A lot of guys think, oh, yeah, I wish I could have you know, like the Mormons believed back in the day, uh, multiple wives, you know, and they think, wow, what a blessing this is, and, you know, how great it would be, and this and that and the other. Uh, personally, I think uh, one is enough to try to take care of and try to keep happy. Can you imagine several? Now, Absalom of King David he decided he wanted to be king, so he took matters into his own hands. Do you know he tried to kill his own father to, to take over the kingship? Can you imagine that? A son wanting to kill his father so that he could rise to become king and reign and rule over the kingdom. Hmm. So, can you imagine? You got two different, two different wives, two different sons, and... It creates problems, right? So, let us continue the story. For those of you that heard that, that was probably fireworks. I hope that was fireworks. All right, let us continue the story of Abraham and his two different sons by two different wives and all the problems that it creates. You see, Ishmael was mocking his younger half-brother, Isaac. And Sarah had had enough of this. So let's read in Genesis 21, verse 10. 
Wherefore she, speaking of Sarah, wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son. And that's Hagar, right? Cast out this bondwoman and her son, Ishmael, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Now the Lord allowed Sarah's words to come to pass. Let's read in verse 12. Skip to verse 12. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah hath said unto thee, hearken or listen to her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. See, Abraham's seed or children was to be called in Isaac. So now Hagar, the bomb woman, and Ishmael, the son of the Egyptian woman, were to leave the presence of Abraham. Yet the Lord was to look after Abraham's beloved son. Genesis 21 and verse 15 starts this part of the story. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, I am not 100% sure, but I'm guessing that this is a desert. And let's face it, a desert's a desert because it doesn't have any water. And if you don't have any water, within three days, 90% of the people would be dead. Probably about that in three days without water. And if you're in a desert, it's even less than that. Because the desert just dehydrates your, your skin. I mean... When you're in a dry enough desert, you don't even sweat. You don't even perspire because the water evaporates so quickly. It's so dry. So, all right. So, Abraham gave her bread, bottle of water, sent her away into the wilderness, probably the desert. So, and as the water was spent in the bottle, um, let's see. All right, so, uh, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba and the water was spent. It was gone. And the water was spent in the bottle and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. So she put the kid under one of the shrubs to try to shield him from the sun. You know, it's hot. It'd be comfortable, right? Verse 16, and she went and sat her down over against him a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, let me not see the death of the child. And she sat over against him and lift up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, what aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not. For God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad. You hear this? And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. So, all, uh, many, many of the Arabs claim descent from Ishmael, and I don't doubt it. I believe that many of them probably are. So the Lord had mercy on Ishmael and made a promise to Abraham to make of him a great nation and multiply him. So let us look at the promise that God made to Abraham. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 17 and verse 5. God speaking to Abraham, neither shall thy name 
any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. So God took, his name was originally Abram, and said, your name's going to be Abraham for a father of many nations have I made thee. So God promised Abraham that he'd be the father of many nations. Aren't we so used to hearing the Jews saying that they are, they are all of Abraham? Oh, yeah. So how does one nation over in Palestine called Israel fulfill this promise of many nations? Uh, let's see. Israel, one. Name all these other Jewish nations. There aren't any. Does one nation equal many? If I tell you I'm going to give you many, uh, many, many dollar bills and I give you one, you're going to say, wait a minute, you said you were going to give me many. You only gave me one. One is not many. Okay? One Jewish Israeli state in the Middle East is not many. So, is God able to keep his promises? Or did he lie? Or are we deceived? You see, there are over 250 million Arabs in the world. So I say God keeps his promises. And depending upon who you listen to, there are maybe only up to 18 million Jews who claim descent from Abraham. So if the Jews are all of Isaac, the promised seed... And Ishmael's the, you know, the was blessed, but he wasn't the promised seed. Why are there 250 million Arabs and only 18, up to 18 million Jews? Depending upon which Jewish group you listen to, there's between 12 and 18 million, depending upon how they count them and what have you. But by no means are there more than 18 million Jews in the world. So why are there 250 million Arabs? but only 18 million Jews. Huh. So let us take a look at what the Lord says as a prophecy concerning Ishmael. In Genesis 16, verse 10, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Hagar, right? I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. Okay. All right, let's continue. So this was fulfilled by over 250 million Arabs today. I would say God fulfilled his promise. Now, listen carefully to this. Genesis 16 and verse 10. And he, speaking of Ishmael, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. So look at this carefully. He was to be a wild man whose hand was against every man, and he was to live among his brothers who were Abraham's children. And when it says that your hand is against every man, that means you're fighting everybody. That's what that means. If my hand is against you, that means I'm, I'm fighting you. Okay? And he was to be a wild man. Now, if your preacher, your minister, your whoever says that this doesn't apply and says that this is not true about the Arabs, then who does it apply to? You see, I believe the Bible more than I believe preachers and pastors. I don't believe them. I believe what the Bible says. Does God lie or make promises he cannot keep? I know better than to believe that. 
Has the children of Ishmael been wild men and live in the midst of their brethren and have their hands against every man? Yes, I would say that they have. Now, let us look at the religion of the Arabs and contrast it with the Jews and the Christians. All of the above claim a belief in one God. Arabs, Jews, and Christians all believe in one God. They are called the three monotheistic religions. Mono means one. Theistic means... Um, theology means study of God. Okay, Monotheistic. Uh, and a, um, Now contrast that to the Hindus of India and the old Greek and Romans who had multiple gods. Now... The Arabs claim the Quran as their Bible, as it too is a collection of books. One such book in the Quran is the book of Surah, S-U-R-A. And in chapter 9 and verse 5, it states that, and I quote, fight and slay the pagans, meaning the non-Muslims. Fight and slay the pagans, wherever you find them and seize them, beleaguer them, that means to surround them with troops, beleaguer them and lie in wait for them in every stratagem of war, unquote. This is only one such verse found in the Quran. You see, Muslims attacked Europe on a few occasions and wiped out whole Christian cities. The city of Constantinople was completely destroyed by the Muslims and many Christians were killed. Yet, the Muslims, would you believe that they consider Jesus to be a sinless prophet of God? Now contrast that with the Jews. The Jews believe that Jesus is a false prophet, was a false prophet. Okay, so you got the Jews that say Jesus was a false prophet, and then you got the Jew, uh, Muslims that say Jesus was a sinless prophet of God. Which one's closer to Christianity's belief? Now, Muslims consider Jesus to be a sinless prophet of God, and I agree that, yes, indeed, he is a sinless prophet, and he is also the Son of God. Muslims deny that Jesus was the Son of God, but Jews also de deny that Jesus is the Christ, which is the Greek rendering for Messiah, also. So, what is... The definition of an antichrist. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 22, we read the following. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, or the Messiah, right? Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Okay? Now, if you deny the Son, you're denying the Father that sent the Son. Let's take a look at that real quick. All right, so just in case you think I'm lying, you know, in 1 John 2.22, so who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ, he is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son... The same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. And that is verse 23. All right, so by Bible definition, both Muslims and Jews are Antichrist. Jews deny 
that Jesus was born of a virgin, and they most certainly do not believe he was sinless. In the time of Jesus Christ, it was the Jews and the Romans who killed Christians. Not the Muslims, not the Arabs. They didn't even, you know, they didn't even, uh, Islam didn't even exist in the days that Jesus walked the earth as in human form. But let us see what Paul has to say in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. Even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets. Ooh and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. So here we have both sides of Abraham's children killing the Christian believers at differing points in the history of the church. Do you want to know a secret? Well, look at what the Bible says about just who are Abraham's children. Turn your Bible to Galatians chapter 3 and verse 29. Paul writes, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What promise? The promise is made to Abraham and his children. Now, after World War II, Zionists like Menachem Begin, who became prime minister of the Israelis, detonated a bomb in a hospital, killing patients and doctors and nurses in Jerusalem. I also know that Zionists detonated a bomb in the King David Hotel and killed civilians by the scores. This fact of history is forgotten by our TV and media spin doctors. But it is, this was going on back in the, uh, 40s and the 50s. There is much bloodshed on both sides of the conflict. So Arabs kill Jews, Jews kill Arabs, just like about 10 or 12 years ago, there was a, an unarmed Palestinian man and his 12-year-old son, 12-year-old son, who were shot dead on international TV those years ago. Who killed him? The IDF, Israeli so-called defense force. On national, international TV, shot him dead. They, were, they weren't armed. They were unarmed, both of them. They weren't shooting at anybody, and they killed them both. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Between 10 to 30% of the Palestinians are Christians. Do you support the Antichrist against the Christians? Read 1 John 2 and verse, chapter 2 and verse 22 and 23 again. If you don't know who the Antichrists are, they are they who deny that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah. Do you support them against the Christian Palestinians? Most so called churches do. I wouldn't want to be that pastor in the day of judgment. Now, there has been much bloodshed in the Middle East. American-made fighter bombers of the Israeli Air Force, they dropped bombs on an Arab elementary school and set fire to children, killing about a hundred of them. And we wonder why the Arabs hate us? You know, and the, uh, the, the Israelis just say, well, you know, they're future terrorists. Well, you know, if you uh, dropped napalm gasoline bombs on my child's elementary school and burned, incinerated my child to death, yeah, I guess, you know, there's some people that would want to fight back. And then, you know, they call them, what do they call them? Terrorists. Personally, I think dropping a 
napalm gasoline flaming bomb on top of an, an, an elementary school. I think that's an act of terrorism. What do you think? And we wonder why the Arabs hate us. American-made planes dropped the gasoline bombs. So without the spirit of Christ, both sides will continue to kill each other. Would Jesus say, blessed are they that kill elementary school children. Blessed are they that support the Zionists in dropping flaming napalm gasoline bombs on children. Would Jesus say that? The so-called church of people like John Hagee, they would say so. Jesus said to those who denied him, Jesus said the following to those who denied him in John 8, 44. Ye are of your father, the devil. The lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And if you want to know who Jesus was speaking to, read the next three verses on your own. I'll give you three guesses. He's not speaking to Christians and he's not speaking to the Arabs. In Muslim countries, they never argue over granting rights to sodomites or performing same-sex marriages, and abortion is not legal in any Muslim country. Did you know that Tel Aviv is the legal capital of the Israeli state? And if you were to buy some gay magazines, they would tell you that Tel Aviv, the capital of the Israeli state, is the gay capital of the Middle East. They've had numerous annual gay pride parades. Matter of fact, I think the last one they had had over 100,000 people celebrating their pride of being gay. Look it up, people. I'm not making this stuff up. Go to Google on the news and type in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem gay pride parade. Go to YouTube. You can watch them marching down the street with their Israeli flag waving and their rainbow flag waving. So, you know, the Israelis celebrate that stuff, and yet in the Muslim countries, abortion and sodomy is pretty much illegal. So the Arabs consider the USA the great Satan. And believe me, they have satellite dishes in their countries, and they can watch our TV shows, including Jerry Springer and our sex and violence shows. You know, without Jesus, Muslims are lost. Yet even they know that sodomy and abortion is wrong. What a testimony against the formerly Christians in the USA. Will we wave the American flag and will we bomb women and children in Iraq and Afghanistan and possibly in the future Iran? I wonder what Jesus would say about us bombing women and children. It is a shame that the church has turned the resurrection of Jesus Christ into an Easter egg hunt and traded the birth of Christ for a satanic Exodus tree. Until we purge the church of such practices, Jews and Jehovah's false witnesses as well as Muslims consider us pagans. And will we watch them slip into hell without Christ? Do you know that the Jews are ready to rebuild the temple and start performing animal blood sacrifices? If you don't believe me, look up the, the group, the Temple Mount Faithful and the Temple Mount Institute. Two different groups. They're not related. They're competitors. But you've got two different groups of uh, organizations of Jews that want to rebuild the temple and do animal blood sacrifice. So let's read what the Bible says about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come 
a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Jewish temple that was doing animal blood sacrifices was destroyed by General Titus and the Roman armies in 70 AD. And if my interpretation of the Bible is correct, the Jews will rebuild the temple according to the Bible prior to the Antichrist's appearance. Do you understand what animal sacrifice is in relation to the sacrifice of the shed blood of Jesus? It's basically saying that the blood of Christ was shed for nothing in vain according to the Jews. This is sheer blasphemy if you're a Christian as the Jews seek to rebuild the temple. Yet many so-called churches are assisting in this project for the temple to be built. And then shall the Antichrist come according to the Bible? I think so. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 9 and verse 12, we read, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his, that's Christ, but by his own blood he entered into once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That's the end of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. Now, Christ died for you and his children in whatever country they are in. America, we need to repent and cry out to God. He has withdrawn his blessings and protection from us. If we will not have Christ as Lord, then maybe God will let us have Satan, or maybe let Satan have us. In Matthew chapter 4 and verse 17, we read, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is Chaplain Bob Walker, Light of the World Ministries. I hope you'll uh, consider the words found in the Bible. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. That's Jesus, who is the Christ in his precious name. Amen.